This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. The President and Chief Executive Officer of PBS, Paula Kerger, on this edition of Conversations. Each year, the trade publication The Hollywood Reporter publishes what it calls the Women in Entertainment Power 100. For the past four years, Paula Kerger has been on that list, sharing space with such notables as Ann Sweeney of ABC Disney and Oprah Winfrey. Ms. Kerger took the helm of PBS in 2006. The years that have followed may go down in history as some of the most transformative for the media industry. Now keep in mind that during this time, the way we consume media has drastically changed. From YouTube and Facebook to iTunes and Netflix, media executives are facing challenges that not that many years ago were simply unheard of. In short, the media landscape has been turned upside down. Seeing opportunity, Ms. Kerger has taken the powerful PBS brand into the digital future with a strong focus on arts and education. Prior to taking the role as CEO at PBS, Ms. Kerger was an executive vice president and chief operating officer with Education Broadcasting Corporation, the parent company of PBS stations WNET and WLIW in New York. Paula Kerger, welcome to Conversations. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for joining us. How did you get started in the television industry? Well, it's an interesting story. Um, I um, had been in the nonprofit uh, sector and uh, was approached to come to WNET to actually help them raise money. And I had um, always been interested in public television. I had, uh, as a child, used to sit with my parents um, uh, on Sunday nights in the living room at a time when we all used to sit in the living room right, together and right, watch television. Right. And one had to get up and actually turn the channel on the television set. And I remember. I remember watching uh, programs like uh, Masterpiece Theater, you know, uh, Upstairs, Downstairs, uh, The Six Wives of Henry VIII, Elizabeth R., I, Claudius, and those were moments that I really treasured. But actually, I, I often feel that I was destined to work in public television because my grandfather founded the public radio station in Baltimore. He was a college professor and uh, built the station as a way to give his students a real-world application to microwave technology which was his expertise. Okay. And so uh, public media was always part of my life. My grandfather's radio station broadcast the Metropolitan Opera on uh, Saturday afternoons. Uh, we watched a lot of public television in my family. And of course, growing up uh, in, in the age that I did, one of some of my earliest memories, frankly, were watching television. Mm -hmm. I remember as a very small child sitting about this far from the television set. My right. mother was always <laughs> yelling at me, sit back further, you're ruining your eyes. That's right. And, uh, and watching... Uh, um, I love Lucy mm -hmm. repeats mm -hmm. and uh, and just thinking that you know television was just such an important part of of, uh, of growing up and so yeah. and, and so it in some respects I think it was sort of destiny that I came to public broadcasting how has television changed since you've been in the industry a lot a lot and obviously in our lifetime television has changed profoundly from that you know black and white set that that, that was in our living room to the much larger set to um, now digital technology uh, when I first came into public broadcasting we thought a lot about television and how it was positioned in the cable landscape where there were increasing number of, of channels. Now, of course, in many households, um, there's access to up to 500 channels of, of content. People are watching television on very large screens. They're watching on iPhones and smartphones. They're watching on computers. And so the ability to be able to bring a, a television program uh, into uh, a home or into um, contact with, an, with, a, with a potential viewer is, has changed a lot, but also the way that we think about the production of television has changed. Uh, we build pr television programs like this one that uh, people sit and watch uh, as a one-time event, but we also take the content that we develop and, and we present it in multiple ways. In, uh, in an online environment, you can have a linear video program. You can also lift pieces of interviews that never actually end up in the final, you know, edited version. Uh, you can put uh, alongside that program all of the research that has gone into 
the interview itself. You can put timelines if it's a if it's a historical event. I mean, just the opportunity to think about the programs that you're presenting, and then of course now with social media, you can give mm -hmm. viewers an opportunity to participate in the project mm -hmm. itself. So it's a it's a completely different landscape than it was even uh, five years ago when I came into this job, when YouTube and and Facebook was just an emerging phenomena that was still in college campuses. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the whole world has shifted tremendously, and I think will continue to shift as, as we look forward. I was going to say, things are rapidly changing. How do you as a media executive try to stay on top of it because it's changing almost minute by minute it is particularly minute in the by minute. social media side well the things. social media side and 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 of course just because there's a technology doesn't mean that people will embrace it right. and and move forward so you see lots of different permutations of 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 media that you know some had projected were you know going to really truly explode now of course we're looking at 3d and whether that becomes an emerging technology or not you know the idea of creating uh, work for a very large screen in high definition or a very small screen is 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 a whole different way of, of thinking about it. So um, obviously we read a lot. I'm right. sure as, as you are also mm -hmm. following, you know, the media industry, you know, just trying to look at what everyone else is doing. Uh, but also really thinking in public media, what we think about is not just, well, how can we use this new technology and, and raise money? Right. But we think about this new technology is how can we take some of these new ideas and make it possible to serve the American public in new ways. Right. And so for us, this has just been an exciting time, you know, particularly when I look at what we're doing for kids. Mm -hmm. So we have, over the course of the last five years, six years, completely reinvented our entire children's lineup. I mean, we have great programs like Sesame Street, right. which for trivia buffs has won more Emmy Awards than any program in television history, okay. um, which continues as a series to really think about ways that it can refresh itself and, and really engage kids. But we have a lot of new programs in our schedule, like Sid the Science Kid, which helps kids develop basic science skills, Word Girl, which is basic literacy and so forth. And so we have um, programs that are curriculum based on our schedule. Uh, but we also um, think about the online space as a destination for children, for video, for games. Um, and it is uh, for us a wonderful way not just to entertain children but truly to engage their minds. And when you think about how tele public television was founded, you know, public television was originally founded as educational television, right. the possibilities of this kind of technology. So we've been experimenting now um, with um, different 3D applications online for kids, and it's just children um, are are just so taken with this technology because of all the games and all the things that surround them. So why not use this kind of technology, not just to while away, you know, some hours, but mm -hmm. really to give them some great skills to help them in school. So that's what we're spending a lot of time thinking about. Uh, d did I read somewhere that children who have grown up watching Sesame, St Sesame Street have a tendency to, to be more uh, more likely to read as they get yes. older? Yes. What's the and we've done a lot of research, including some recent um, research uh, around our children's programs that shows that even small um, uh, amounts of time both in broadcast as well as online dramatically increases children's basic uh, literacy skills and we've looked specifically at um, some of the programs that we now have in our schedule like Martha Speaks and Super Y which are all intended to help children with basic literacy. We've been developing uh, content for uh, smartphones and for iPads uh, specifically for kids, not that we're expecting parents to go out and buy iPads and iPhones for their right. children, but you know, how many times have you been in a grocery store with a small child and they're slowly pulling everything off of the shelves as you're trying to get through the checkout line? If you can imagine, you know, a parent pulling out an iPhone and pulling up an application that um, that is um, connected to Super Y, which is one of the of the apps that we have built, and in that in that few moments, while not only are you distracting your child from pulling the stuff off the shelf, but you can create a teachable moment. Right. You know, for me, that's a great opportunity. For a lot of homes, for a lot of um, homes, the smartphone may be the only computer that they mm -hmm. have. And so if we can create content that makes those devices 
um, powerful educational instruments, from my perspective, that's a great thing. So we've been doing the research alongside of it because we want to make sure that we're creating content that isn't just the diverting content, you know, during moments like I've described in the grocery store, but also is content that truly is helping children learn and grow. And so as teachers are looking for um, material to use in the classroom and are using uh, computers and iPads and so forth, building out that kind of content that helps to create those moments for them as well is very much a part of our mission and what we stay focused on. I know one of the things that commercial broadcasters are struggling with right now, and, and, and I guess anybody would be really, is how to monetize the new technologies. What are your thoughts on that? Well, for us, obviously, we're not building this work just to make a buck. Right. And uh, what we're thinking about is the public service mission. But obviously, the funding of it is important to us because we are, although we are a nonprofit organization, we do, like every well-run business, need to uh, deliver a um, break-even budget, and we need to be able to fund the work that we're attempting to do. And so the way that we're funded is uh, we get um, some government money. It's about 15 percent. That's one five percent of our overall budget in public broadcasting. That money, by the way, goes to stations. Uh, for this station, it's about 20, 22 percent of their budget actually comes from the federal government, and that pays for a lot of the overall expenses, you know, uh, to, to run the station. Uh, we then um, receive uh, a significant part of our um, income from contributions from viewers like you. Right. And so for people that are supporters of public media, they should know that it's their individual philanthropy that really does enable us to accomplish the work that we do in public broadcasting. With that individual philanthropy, we would not exist. And then we do look for corporate sponsorship. Right. Uh, we look for foundation support, and in some cases, we also earned some revenue. Some of our stations, in fact, this one um, leases out some studio capacity, and that's a good way to bring in some needed resources. Now, for the online work, um, you know, there's an opportunity. A lot of organizations are, be, are using their websites and putting on advertisements and looking for ways to try to monetize. Um, we are particularly careful around our kids' content. Mm -hmm. If you go on to PBS Kids, you're not going to see ads and stuff floating around trying to sell your children, you know, um, cereal or soda pop or toys or anything. What we use that space is for educational purposes. Uh, but we have been experimenting a little bit with some sponsorship geared towards parents on the, on the kid site because we never want to sell mm -hmm. to children. Right. Um, and then for our overall site, we've used it as a way to also try to talk to people about membership. Mm -hmm. And so we've thought about different ways that we might actually raise some additional money uh, online. One of the ideas is to think about the vast library that we have in public broadcasting. And as we have in the past, we have sold videotapes and DVDs as a way to raise money. Perhaps some of the older programs, you know, you could, you know, pay to use them or, right. you know, or something. We're starting to think about different ways that we can bring the resources in so that we can generate even more content that meets the needs of our communities. I, I think broadcasters in general are finding some of that old content has some real value yes, over it, time. Yes, it yeah. does. And I think for us, of course, we're always trying to juggle, you know, the public interest versus the need for us to raise resources too. So I think that w what we always want to do is we think about, you know, the work that we have online and, and other ways that we're distributing content is that you want to have a robust service that's available free and that is accessible to everyone. Uh, but I think if there are some ways that, you know, we can also earn some money to help us do the work that, that we need to do, that's something that we're very much committed to figuring out. Speaking of children's programming, you've been rather critical of some of the commercial broadcasters for not exactly, you know, getting in line with the Television Act. I believe that it was the yes. Kids Television Act yeah. that passed in, in 1990. Expand on that. Well, I think that um, the Children's Television Act was really intended to um, um, hold broadcasters accountable to the public service obligation, and they are supposed to broadcast a certain amount of educational children's content every week, um, and it, and they're really responsible for broadcasting just a few hours every week. I mean, we, by, by lunchtime on Monday, have already met our public service obligation, and I think that there's also a, a bit of a uh, interpretation of what's really truly educational. Wow. I think that, um, you know, broadcasters should um, um, 
you know, take that seriously. And if not, then perhaps we shouldn't be empowered to fully do that and, and fully funded to, to be able to deliver the kinds of true educational content. Media is tremendously powerful. Yes, and, I, you know, when you think about the impact that it has on young children, I think we all share an obligation as to what they see and what they're uh, exposed to. And so from my perspective in public media, what we try to do is really use the power of that media for its, its best purpose, which is to open children's minds, to help them, uh, particularly the youngest children, enter school ready to learn. And so I, I, I feel that, you know, all broadcasters, though, bear some of that obligation and they should really think about what it is they're doing. There is a lot, there are a lot of people now that are producing children's content. And some of it is good. Some of it is not so good. Right. And, um, and I think that parents need to be very careful what, with what their children are exposed to and the advertising around it. And I think that for children, it's very hard, and there's been a lot of research that shows that children have a difficult time discerning the, the program content from advertisements. And so I do think that we all bear an obligation to really think about what children are seeing and hearing, and because it does shape their, their, their young minds. I'll ask you this question, put you on the spot just a little bit about this. I, I, I think we could almost go anywhere and ask anyone, and they would tell you, for the most part, that there is a lot of trash on television this day and age, okay? But you take a look at, at PBS and, and a handful of the cable channels and the quality programming that continues to get great ratings. My question in, as an industry, as a whole, why do you think that broadcasters and executives are, are appealing to the lowest common denominator? Well, I think, um, you know, as you look at the whole media landscape, it's become so tremendously competitive. And so there, you know, we've moved a, a, a long distance from the time when there were the networks and a few independent stations and, and public media. And so you have an entire media um, landscape that is shifting rapidly. You've got the competition amongst all of the broadcasters and cable, of course, mm -hmm. but then you also have um, the internet. You've got different distribution like, like Netflix and other ways that people can access content. And so what's happened is, is a few things. One is everyone is really scrambling to create programming that is popular. Mm -hmm. They're also scrambling to try to reduce their costs of production so that their ROI um, remains as as robust as, as it can. And so I think the combination of those two things has resulted in, you know, anytime there's a success in one area, then everyone tries to replicate that. So you, you see that playing out, but you also see uh, a rush to production that is, that is ch cheaper. Mm -hmm. So that's where all the reality shows have come from right. because they're significantly cheaper than any of the scripted work that the networks do. And so um, I think that that has just caused us a, uh, a bit of a slide. And you look at some of the cable companies that s established cable channels that were in essence the, um, I think the, the corporate or the for-profit version of public television. And I think the good examples of that are like the History Channel is, is, is a really good example yeah. right now, or Bravo. You know, Bravo started out to be an arts and culture channel and, and they did that for a while, but now they're doing a lot of programs like uh, Top Chef, which is different. Right. History Channel, their big shows right now are, are shows like Pawn Stars right. and Ice Road Truckers. Right. And it's just because they're popular and they're, right. and they're going after that younger male audience that advertisers, you know, are so interested in, in appealing to. And right. I think so that it's it's all shifted. And, and so we stand alone in really trying to, to figure out programs that are not just commercially viable, but are programs that really meet the needs of, of communities. And, and that, that, I think, has kept us in good stead with the work that we produce. Our whole focus is on producing programs of great quality and substance. And we don't start out with a project thinking, how can we raise the most in advertising mm -hmm. money, and how can we bring the most eyeballs to this program? We think, how can we create programs that truly are important? And you know what? People come. They do. And so people think that, um, you know, perhaps public television may not have as big an audience of, you know, some of these other cable channels. But the reality is we bring more people to public television than most of these other cable services. Yeah. Speaking of cost cutting and, and how it can play an effect on society, I think one of the places that we're seeing it is with news. Oh, absolutely. Uh, news organizations greatly absolutely. cutting back. 
your thoughts? Well, I think that a couple things. One is you see um, a great reduction in the amount of, um, of international news, and frankly, local news has also been hit very hard in, in this era of media consolidation. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the challenge right now with the pressure that newspapers are under, um, I, I'm very concerned about how people in communities really get information about what's going on in the communities. The other thing, again, in, in the chasing of of ratings is that even respectable news organizations are spending a lot of time talking about um, uh, you know Lindsay Lohan and you yeah. know stories that at the end of the day really are not of significance to us as a as a society and so you know here you have such important stories that are playing out in the Middle East and Japan and that's what I want information about and I want information that is news mm -hmm. the other trend that I see happening in, in in news right now is the blending of point of view and actual news coverage yeah. and I think there's huge consequence to that I want to understand news I want to understand it in context and why it matters and what are the issues that as a country we need to wrestle with mm -hmm. and I think that that's why um, we have such a deep commitment to series like the news hour mm -hmm. which by the way has larger rating than CNN mm -hmm. and um, the news hour is I think um, unique now in the in the media landscape because it does try to tackle the important issues of the day. It also looks at how um, these stories um, are playing out here and, and around the world. And again, it it, it does that um, uh, most important service, which I think is lacking, which is it it puts the stories in, into context. The other um, series that I think is tremendously important from from uh, the PBS standpoint is our series like Frontline, because mm -hmm. again, I think investigative journalism is yet another area that um, I, you know, you see some of the networks have chipped away a, a bit at their in right. investigative units, and I think it is important. Uh, we did a recent um, program on Frontline around the uh, coroners and the medical examiners um, in this country, and and really the challenges of how cost cutting has impacted their work and why that's of significance with, you know, with um, people that have committed crimes that have been able to go free because there isn't that kind of, of oversight within the coroner and the medical examiner's office. I think these are important stories that, frankly, you know, commercial media is, is not going to cover because mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the programs that are going to generate the large enough audience, you know, to meet advertiser needs. Would your future goals include uh, even more emphasis on news? Yes. So the three areas that we're most focused on where we do see um, market failure in, in, the, um, <coughs> in the media landscape is Yes News, and uh, we are... Um, continuing our investment in, in NewsHour Frontline and looking for other ways that we can bring important stories to even series like Nova, for example, is right now working on a documentary uh, related to the uh, situation in Japan. Mm -hmm. So looking at it from the scientific perspective. Right, right. Uh, the other mm -hmm. area is, um, is children's educational content curriculum-based material. And then the third area is the arts. Mm -hmm. And we haven't talked about that at all um, in this discussion, but the arts is um, something that used to have a, a significant presence on television, and it's really disappeared. There's Glee, and there's, you know, there's American Idol, and there's Dancing with wow. the Stars. But outside of that, there really isn't uh, much attention on the broad spectrum of arts. Mm -hmm. Everything from the American songbook and jazz, to theater, to musicals, uh, to opera, to visual arts, that really doesn't exist anywhere else. And there's great work that's happening around the country. Mm -hmm. And I would love for every American to have a front row seat to experience the best of the arts that's created in this country. And that's something that I think is very much at the center of what public media has done in the past and what I would like to see us do more in the future. What are the biggest challenges you see for media in general as, w as we move forward? Well, I think the increased competition is is uh, is certainly um, going to be a challenge and really figuring out how all of these new media 
um, opportunities sort of come together. I think the second for both commercial media as well as for public media is, and where are the resources to uh, to support the work that we're doing uh, on the commercial side is how does the advertising business continue to evolve and play out for us? It's to figure out where are the new opportunities for us to bring in the kinds of resources that we need to produce the programs that we do. Children's educational content is not cheap to produce right. because you're looking to produce something that children want to watch, so it has to be engaging, it has to be contemporary. But then when you also are layering in the educational material, it's it's um, it's a challenge to keep that all pieced together because if it's finished, children aren't going to watch right, it, you know? Right, right. So, because they do control the remote. <laughs> yes. So, so being able to build that in a way that, that really is resonant to children and also to really look at the new technology and figure out how to, to make it work to its best possible purpose. So, mm. that'll be, I think, the big challenge for us ahead. If, if we have this conversation five years from now, mm. wh what do you think things will look like? Oh, that's a great question, and if I could answer that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'd all be rich, right? <laughs> yeah, we'd all be rich. I, was, I started to say, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think that uh, what we will see is a couple things. One is I think that the whole evolution of people um, using material on multiple platforms will expand. I think more and more people will be using tablet type of, of devices to be able to watch television. I think the whole advent of mobile television mm -hmm. is really something that's, that we're quite interested in following. I think that there will be a, a, a continued expansion of um, of opportunities for citizens to engage in the in the content that's being produced, and so whether it's on a, on the news side as, as citizen journalists and contributing in their own perspectives on stories, to uh, people taking content and mashing it up and and sort of using it for their own purposes, I think that will continue. Um, and I I think I see a a, a further. Uh, consolidation of, of companies that are, you know, controlling content and distribution. I, I see that as something that, um, you know, particularly with the Comcast NBC merger, I, th I see, I think that there's going to be different uh, combinations of media organizations such as that within the next five years. And, and a short answer on that, is that good or bad? Um, I think that it underscores the need for public media, you know, a media service that is community-based. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't talked about that at all, but our stations are all independent. They're owned by people in communities. This station right. is not owned by PBS in Washington. It's owned by the people of Pensacola. And I think that that's increasingly important as people in this community run this station. They're concerned about the needs of the people uh, here and build content that meets those needs. And I think that as you look forward over the next five years, stations like WSRE are even more important. Good point. Paula Kerger, it was a real pleasure. Very nice to meet Great you. Great to meet you. I know you've got some challenging years ahead because <laughs> things are so rapidly changing in the media business. But it's exciting, it and I think exciting. the opportunities are really great. And uh, and that's why, for all of us in public media, this is actually an amazing time for us. Thanks. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much. Paula Kerger, she is the president and the chief executive officer of PBS. Speaking of all this new media, well, you can fly around Facebook and you'll find us. Just search out Conversations with Jeff Weeks. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Jeff Weeks. Take good care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.